graduates, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I want to welcome you to the fourth technical session of the engineering sessions at the 16th International Research Conference of General Sir John for the Lyle Women's University. I'm with the team, achieving resilience through digitalization, sustainability, and sectoral transformation. The ultimate objective of this conference is to achieve national development under the new normal conditions. With the theme of the fourth session as Achieving Resilience Through Hybrid Engineering Research, today we have a fascinating lineup of research presentations covering a wide range of topics that represents a significant contribution to the field of hydraulic engineering. Before we dive into these enlightening presentations, it is my great pleasure to introduce our esteemed session chair today, Dr. Samir Somersekar, Senior Lecturer from the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Shujawa, Dr. Somersekar completed his Bachelor of Science of Engineering Honors with a first class at the University of Moratua, sorry, University of Moratua, and Master of Science in the field of Civil Engineering from the University of Moratua. Also, he obtained a Master of Science degree in the field of Sustainability Science at the University of Tokyo and completed his PhD in the field of Coastal Engineering and Management at the University of Tokyo. His research interest is on the state of the art serving techniques for water resource engineering. Well acquainted with both natural and social sciences, he has accomplished various awards and grants. As a renowned expert in the field of hybrid engineering, with a wealth of knowledge and experience, Dr. Samar Zegre, we are privileged to have you as our session chair for this this occasion. Also, with us we have our session speakers, SM Rajasimha, KMSS Gunatilaka, Kalanda NCP Sarnaka, and Ada Nimbada. Without further delay, I want to welcome the session chair of the technical session four, Dr. Samir Samarsekar, to conduct the session's proceedings. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I think uh, without further delay, we could start the session. Uh, so there are uh, four presenters today. And the first presenter is uh, Ms. Sukuni Rana Singha, and uh, she is a graduate in this university. And uh, her field of interest is on the field of hydrology and environmental engineering. And her paper will be investigation of trends in multi day extreme rainfall. And she is the first author, and including WCDK Fernando and Mrs. Vikram Surya. So, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Sukhmi Rajasekha, and I consider it an honor to present my research investigation of trends in multi day extreme rainfall in front of God. And um, so let me start by asking you why is the study of rainfall trends so important? I believe that it's quite evident that in the recent history, climate ha patterns have been dynamic, temperatures and rainfall patterns are changing. And here, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has stated that the globe would reach two Celsius of global warming within the middle of this century and at a global scale for each additional one Celsius extreme daily rainfall events will intensify by 7%. So this research is focused on identifying trends in multi-day extreme rainfall. To clarify, according to the World Meteorological Organization, extreme rainfall is an incident where the mean rainfall is higher than a specific threshold for a certain period. And why are we focusing research on multi-day analysis of rainfall? Globally, according to Fitch, globally extreme flood events show an increasing trend of being caused by multi-day rainfall. So to bring your attention to why this 
necessary to conduct research on multi-day rainfall again instead of the usual one-day rainfall or annual rainfall. Let me give you a few examples taken from very recent history. Um, if you remember, back in 2003, 2016 and 2017, flooding was observed in Sri Lanka. And let me point out that all of these flooding events were not caused by one-day rainfall. It was due to multi-day rainfall. So in 2003, it was due to a four-day rainfall. And 2016, again four days. And in 2017, it was due to a five-day rainfall. Um, the study was conducted on the Kalani River Basin for 15 selected rainfall gauge stations. And 57 years of rainfall data from 1960 to 2016 was utilized for the study. So, the objectives of this paper was first to test the homogeneity of the selected daily rainfall data for the Kalani River Basin and to detect trends in extreme rainfall data of the Kalani River Basin using both parametric and non-parametric methods for the multi-day scale. To compare the results obtained from the modified Marikander sense slope estimator with the results of the innovative trend analysis method, which is the recently found method. The methodology of this research was first obtain the daily rainfall data within the Canada basin from the World Meteorological Department, and then a quality control for the rainfall data was performed using the R Index software, an R based program. And then for all the rainfall stations, the data was assessed for homogeneity using the RHS3 score. Then for all the rainfall gate stations, the rainfall data was extracted for one to seven day series using the block maximum method. Then the rainfall data was analyzed using modified man tender and sensor estimator. And then the innovative trend analysis method, which are non-parametric and the linear regression test, they are the student <coughs> test, which are parametric methods. And then the trends of the data series were detected using the above mentioned uh, trend test. <coughs> Results and discussion. First, um, one day maximum rainfall series. Mouse Kale and Norm both showed a significant positive trend in the rainfall data, while none of the other stations showed any positive trend. Uh, it can be observed that uh, Bopatthalara has a close to significant negative trend. Now, uh, the innovative trend analysis method gives you a graph as a result. And here in Cambrian and instead, you can see that there is no trend. It's between the one-to-one -one line. And for the Southern Hospital, you can see the beginning is no trend and um, it goes to a positive trend by the end. And Norton, you can clearly see that it has a positive trend. Now I want you to pay special attention here to the Colombo graph. And before that, uh, it's important to note that in the innovative trend analysis method, it is possible for the graph to show a non-monotonic trend and for the points to be on both sides of the one-to-one -one line. Such points can be divided into clusters as seen on the graph on your right and can help identify hidden trends in the rainfall series. And this is a plus point of using innovative trend analysis method in rainfall analysis. And we can divide the data in the graph to clusters. And now you can look at the Kalama graph at your left and you can see that while the low cluster is on no trend, the medium cluster is on a negative trend, close to no trend, but the high cluster means the high rainfall values are on an extremely positive side. This indicates that the extreme one-day rainfall events are drastically increasing in Kanako in recent history. And to give some background on this statement, you can see from the table that from 1901 to 1950, the percentage of rainfall which have been above 200 millimeters is at 10 percent, while above 250 millimeters have been 6 percent. And from 1951 to 2000, about 200 millimeter rain had been at 10%, while about 250 millimeters had been at 4%. But from 2001 to 2016, it can clearly identified that about 200 millimeter rain has increased up to 25%, and about 250 millimeters it has 
increased to 12%. And this is the spatial distribution of trends for one day maximum rainfall. And as I mentioned previously, note and amounts that have a positive significant trend. In the case of two day maximum rainfall, both um, just mouse and LA show a significant positive trend, while uh, Norton still shows a positive trend, it is no longer significant. And this is the spatial distribution for the two day maximum rainfall, just mouse and LA showing a positive trend. In the case of three day maximum rainfall, again, none of the um, rainfall stations show a significant trend, while some have showed close to significant trend, for example, they like Palapa, close to being negatively significant. Again, it was uh, not significant. But in the case of 4D, Vedar Palapa has showed a significantly negative trend, while all the other stations are still showing no trend. And in the case of 5D, again, um, none of the stations showed a significant trend. Again, for 6 day maximum rainfall, none of the rainfall field stations show any significant trend. And the, case, the same case for 7 day maximum rainfall, none of the stations show significant trend. To conclude, significant positive trends were observed for Mount Sakai for 1 day and 2 day, and for Norton 1 day. Significant negative trends are present for Vipar Palava for 4 days, while not significant at 95%. Mausakale showed a considerably high positive trend for 3 and 4 days, while Gopal Palava showed a close to significant negative trend for 1 day. And Vipar Palava showed a considerably high negative trend for both 3 and 7 days. Now, considering the lower catchment of the Canary River, it has both positive and negative <coughs> trends, though none are significant. And comparing results from 1 to 7 day, a clear pattern cannot be identified. Those positive and negative trends both seem to diminish as the series go from 1 to 7 day, meaning even though there might be some changes in the trend in 1 day to 2 day, uh, in the case of multi day, 5, 6, 7, you are not seeing any change in the existing trend. And for the upper catchment, it has positive trends, except for both of Palava, Mangoda, and Devan Palava. Both positive and negative uh, significant trends are located on the upper catchment. And here I would like to say that the relatively new method that uh, was found in 2012, I believe, it is the Inuitic Trend Analysis Method, proved to be commendable in identifying smaller trends within the data series and the ability to visualize, visually observe the variation within the trend is also a positive side of using the Inuitic Trend Analysis Method. So, here are the selected references used for the study. And thank you. I would especially like to thank the officials of the Climate Resilience Improvement Project for their assistance in supplying the relevant rainfall data. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And I think that what we feel, what we are getting in these days, this kind of extreme rainfall, right? Yes. It's a timely study, and I think the whole panel, all the members in this room, might understand the importance of this kind of research. And of course, uh, you have used uh, novel technologies like using R, and they did some analysis, and it's a positive contribution. Uh, so, uh, maybe to start uh, asking questions, I have uh, one question actually. That question is why did you select the catchment to this kind of a study? Because if you select something like the, the normal, even uh, rainfall zones, right? You know, the rainfall zones, right? So, so if you select several locations, or if you can get data from several locations in these kind of 
rainfall zones, then uh, you can make a more wider conclusion. What do you think about that? I think you are referring to, for example, select um, bed zone and rainfall stations. Yes, yes, yes. I believe that's a great idea. So uh, the reason that the catchment is selected uh, because Kalani River Basin catchment has been seeing a lot of flood. And we thought that it's a good chance to take this research, to conduct this research, so that we can find, to see if the flooding will be increasing and thereby we'll be able to do something regarding the flooding that has been occurring. Um, but I believe that uh, considering the bed zone of the dry zone would also be a great idea for research. Will you continue this research? I would like to. I believe so. Then, then I think you can continue. We have five more minutes. Uh, if you have questions, you can ask from us. Regression analysis and that. So you take something like 25 years. Um, it's actually 57 years from 1960 to 2016. Okay. Uh, what uh, I didn't exactly how we can predict the trend in future mm -hmm. or what is the exact pattern. Could you please elaborate that how we can identify such kind of uh, consecutive reinforce we can expect on these? Time period and so and so. How, how we can predict that? Because I didn't get exactly the point. How we see the trends, how we identify it before it happens with your results, with your previous results, how the trend goes, and which, which month and which dates are the most possible, or is there any other way to think about it? Uh, I, I didn't get exactly the point. So that's why I'm asking, please celebrate that. How we can predict this flooding and all this, we can earlier. Um, so, this research was conducted using extreme rainfall data, meaning I have selected the extreme value of each year, and therefore it cannot predict a specific date as to which an extreme event can occur. These are the descriptive data you are just presenting, whatever available. So, what I Is can I can predict what I can say is, for example, if you take the Columbus Nation, um, it has been seeing an extreme rainfall event rise, meaning it has a positive trend. So if you were able to see the graph from the IRM Veterans for Columbus Rainfall Gate Station, it has a clear rise, meaning that the extreme rainfall events will be increasing. Increasing in the period of what? It is currently increased. So in present. So compared to compared to 1960 rainfall, in for the recent history, the rainfall trends, the extreme rainfall events have increased and extreme. So what should be the message should I take home? That, that what what should I take? Because I didn't get any, any, any exact. Uh, I I saw that okay there are heavy rainfalls mm -hmm. these days and these times and so and so. But there should be a message for us to bring. Yes, because, because the increment of extreme events is crucial in the construction of dams, for example. Because uh, in the case of extreme rainfall events in dam construction, if an, a big event can, uh, if a big event occurs, that means the dam will be in a dangerous situation where it can fail. Yeah, but when it's happened, you will tell that. But before it happened, how So you now we know that the trend is increasing, we can prepare for that. So this is, a, I, I believe that your questions are quite good, but for these are for future um, researchers and I believe I would like to take your questions as a um, uh, chair suggested for a further research instead. Okay, because I, I don't think we can see the trends and we can predict something for periods and periods and all this. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so we will, we will have a Q&A session at the end. Uh, so you can ask questions uh, at the end. Okay, uh, thank you very much thank for you. your presentation.
presenter is uh, AMSS Srimati Rakar and she is also completed her, her degree in the field of civil engineering in, in, in this university and uh, her research interest is also in the field of hydrology and she will present the uh, estimation of probable maximum precipitation in the context of climate change the main author is K. M. S. S. Gunatilaka together with uh, W. C. D. K. Fernando and S. S. Vikram Sufi. Over to you. Yeah, I am S. S. Gunatilaka from the Department of Civil Engineering of KU. And uh, my research interest is on the estimation of problem as precipitation in the context of climate change. These are the table of contents of my presentation. And talking a little bit about the background of this, this research, uh, dams are one of the most important structures in the civil engineering world. And the safety of the dam structures is utmost important uh, because uh, if such dams fail due to overtopping, it will cause a tremendous disaster. So the design stage of dam structure is utmost important. And for the design of dam structures, we need something called proper maximum flood. And to estimate the problem as we fly, uh, in the, we need to estimate the problem as some precipitation. So, to ensure the safety of the dam structures, the accuracy of the problem as some precipitation should be really high. And in the introduction, you can read the definition uh, from the slide as well, but I would like to highlight a few uh, points in this introduction. Here it says uh, there's no allowance made for long term climate trends. Actually, uh, the World Meteorological Organization's manual, or the WMO manual in 1973 and 1986, they say that the PMP uh, is not making any allowance for long term climatic trends. But in the manual of 2009, they have incorporated a little bit uh, in the uh, manual. So, there, are, there is an Australian case study that uh, using the moisture, moisture maximization method, saying that there is uh, no significant increase in moisture availability. So there is no need of updating the PMP with climate change. But in some studies with the huge projections using GCM and RC models, they say that there is a possibility to increase the PMP change uh, with, the, with the climate change. So in common, all of them conclude that in the future there will be a need to uh, modify the ch uh, changes in the EMA with the climate change. And uh, these are the me uh, methods of EMA estimation. And there are two main methods, the hydrometeorological approach. Uh, the, if we have the data of surface dew point temperature, maximum dew point temperature, and daily and for records, we can go with hydrometeorological approach. And the, I have used the statistical approach with the use of daily rainfall records. And as a study area, I have taken the Cal catchment, covering both the upper and lower catchment, uh, using 16 stations. And this table shows the details of the 16, 16 stations. And the map shows the location of each station. And uh, to uh, specifically say, I have used our statistical software, uh, Microsoft Excel, and our GIS for the research purposes. And for the research, I have used 57 years of uh, data from 1960 to 2016 and in the WMO manual it says long records are recommended when estimating PMP and uh, one of the long records can be calculated as for the equation given in the uh, slide. Uh, but in the case where I have used split sampling, I will uh, explain in the furthermore slides, but in the case where I have applied split sampling, the uh, number of data samples is not enough, but I would recommend in the future, to, if we can find more data, we can go, uh, get a good estimation for PMP with the split sampling as well. These are the major objectives of my research, to upgrade the envelope technique, which is used to estimate the PMP, and to uh, estimate the station specific 24 PMP values for the calendar basin, and that's to construct PMP map for calendar measurement. And I would like to emphasize this is the first time in Sri Lanka we are constructing PMP maps for such a catchment. 
and uh, when considering the uh, methodology, the study has been divided into five different scenarios. The first few steps sh uh, shown in the slide is common to all the five scenarios, and I have collected the data, skimmed through the data, and found out the annual maximum daily concentration of each data set, and then I have calculated the mean and the standard deviation for each data set of each station. The arguments I have separated the parts according to several scenarios. And the first three scenarios are based on developing the end learning curve. And the fourth scenario is regarding uh, the effect of outliers on the PMP. And the last scenario is uh, related to addressing the climate change. And scenario one is a statistical Hirschfeld method, and that's the most uh, common method and figure according to the procedures of the WMO network. And the scenario two and three is the flow chart which is used to develop the modified end learning curve. Uh, I have used the historical extreme values for some stations which have exceeded the maximum precipitation observed data the series in the years 1940 and 1947. Then observed that the K value is higher than the obtained value. Uh, also, there are some observed extreme values in Sri Lanka context as well, such as Nedun Kern and Balakuta. Considering all those values, I developed the modified end learning curve which suits best for Sri Lanka context. And in scenario 4, I have conducted the outlier detection test using interquartile range test. And in scenario 5, I have uh, used the split sampling uh, to see the effect of climate change uh, by dividing the data set, the whole data set, into two samples. And I have tried to find the possible changes uh, that can happen to each factor, say in the uh, equation. And uh, so I calculated the percentage differences of the mean standard deviation, coefficient of deviation, and PMP, and plotted uh, the graphs of, to observe the uh, changes in the climate for all the data sets. And these are the results on the commercial statistical approach. And I have found that the actual k value in the green line is very much less than the values obtained from the virtual curve represented in the red line. So the very high k values may lead to overestimation of PMP. So the need of modifying this curve uh, enhances. So this is the scenario two and three, as I explained in the methodology as well, because um, I have obtained the gray line as the end learning curve only using historical extremes in the Calvin measurement. But the points in yellow is the street values in Sri Lanka context showing high k values. So if such an event occurs we should keep allowance for them as well. So the point of modification starts uh, or it is desired as uh, came at 14.8 from the Sri Lanka value. So the uh, curve is modified such that the average annual maximum precipitation lower than 113.7 will have the K value of 14.8. Uh, so the blue horizontal line up to x value of 113.7 and the red line which is the virtual curve will be the modified curve. Uh, so this is the completing my first objective of this research and also using this concept I have uh, calculated the PMP showing the table completing the second objective. And in the higher annual average maximum daily precipitation also I observe that we can modify the curve furthermore bringing the curve down. So in scenario 3, I have brought up the value for the movie below, even in high annual average maximum daily precipitation, uh, and that will be the curve. And scenario 4 is detection of outliers using IQR or the interquartile image test, and the stations highlighted in pink, having only one outlier giving the PMP value, same as the Hirschfeld method, and the stations in grey have two outliers which reduces the Hirschfeld value and other stations have no outliers and the PMP is greater than the actual Hirschfeld PMP values. So the effect of outlier should be considered when calculating the PMP. And this is addressing the third objective of my research. These are the maps developed uh, for the Hirschfeld PMP as scenario 1, the maps for modified curve as scenario 2 and the maps uh, for the effect of outliers in scenario 4 and I would like to emphasize again uh, this is the first time in Sri Lanka we are developing such spatial temporal PMP maps uh, as a uh, in the initial stage we uh, developed it for the CAD attachment and we are hoping to develop it for the whole Sri Lanka context. And these are the results from the split sample here I have got the first stage 
thickness of the splitted data sets and the whole data set. As from the graph, there is no much difference in the mean, but in most of the stations, mean has slightly increased with the second data series. And in the percentage difference of standard deviation, we have obtained the high standard deviation in the second series. Noticeably, in Kalam, you can see it from the graph, this may be due to the presence of outline as well. Uh, so, this, since the standard deviation is increasing, definitely the PMP will increase in the second data sample. Here we can see the PMP in this uh, station Columbia has increased a lot because of the increase in standard deviation, uh, but the mean has not changed much, so we can come to a conclusion that there may be a relation between the percentage increase in standard deviation and PMP. Uh, when I plot this graph, I found that the percentage increase in standard deviation varies linearly in the PMP. So it is clear that to see whether there is an increase in PMP kind of change, we can check the change in standard deviation. But here, although standard deviation increased in a uh, large amount, the change in PMP is very low. So we can come to a conclusion that there is no need of updating the PMP values in the climate change. But as we also observed in the literature, uh, if the climate trend keeps increasing, we may have to update it uh, in the future. Uh, so as a conclusion, I would like to recommend some uh, future relations for this research. Uh, to uh, climb, if, the, if we are studying about the climate change, uh, the climate change should be studied in further more with the rainfall trends in the future. And also I recommend uh, or, and also I suggest that the PMP should be estimated for lengthy records so that you will have enough uh, records uh, for the split sampling and uh, adequate number of samples will be there and also I would recommend to uh, develop the PMP maps for the poetry and the context. Um, these are some references which I have used for my uh, research. And I would like to acknowledge the Department of Meteorological Sri Lanka, the Climate Resilience Improvement Project, the CREEP project in Sri Lanka for providing the necessary data. Um, thank you very much for listening to my presentation and I would like to uh, invite you to, um, if you have any uh, questions, please do contact me via my email and if you have any further clarifications, please feel free to ask. Okay, uh, thank you for your presentation. <coughs> yes, uh, I totally agree that uh, this research is also a very timely research and estimation of probable maximum precipitation actually, so I have to make a one note, uh, one of the author in this paper was my, the, the, my teacher who taught me the first thing about this uh, precipitation and hydrology. So I think uh, he might give a guidance for you. Uh, so you have done a good job, but uh, one question. So you have a data set from 1960 to 2016. Why don't you have most recent data set? Uh, sir, actually, it was unable uh, for us to take the uh, data sets from the meteorological department. So, in the future, we are hoping to add some more data and the most recent data. And also, uh, I would like to say that uh, in the future, we are doing some uh, future projections as well to estimate the future projections, uh, which have uh, been done. But what are the uh, changes that have been done to the climate change? Okay, thank you. And uh, so, one of the suggestion to your research, right? So, you you said uh, that what your plan is to develop uh, PMP maps kind of the thing. But uh, my suggestion is uh, don't think about uh, developing something like this kind of hard copy maps, but try to develop some uh, database or something online accessible platform. Then follow can access such kind of thing, but if you limit this kind of design charts or something into a book, then uh, most of us will not have access. Then again, I think if we need to do similar
particular study in the catchment area, then again we will buy data from the research department and do the same study. Then we don't need to reinvent the wheel, then in that case, uh, instead of uh, developing hard copy type maps, try to develop something in online that everyone can access. And uh, for the audience, uh, we have limited time, but of course, surely you will have time at the end to ask questions. So we will move to the next question. Thank you. I am up for the Hamburg. 
my objectives to evaluate the real climate inside and outside the apartment harbor to say to design the economic viability of this project to find a suitable location to fix the brain water type or the obvious methodology select the implementation area evaluate the climate in ambarkata calculate swell wave height and the significant wave height actually how i got this data through the sri lanka dai hydrography uh, 2019 uh, they deploy a wave rider boy at ambarkata harbor to get swell waves a uh, height and a significant wave height uh, i did a similar project in uh, australian maritime college university of tasmania 2017 to 2019 based on that i wanted to develop simulator owc simulator in kd that's why i am trying to give this insight to our young people and the lecturers here what is swell waves swell waves end of local uh, wind source wind wave become swell waves what is significant wave height that is uh, height of the random waves in sea state uh, generally suddenly the waves comes up right that wave is the significant wave height with this we deployed that uh, boy for three years unfortunately with uh, some uh, electrical and mechanical uh, uh, defects we obtained data for 40 days that's why i ended up with 30 days because uh, 30 to 40 days also data is not within the board here it was revealed that the maximum mean swell height and the significant wave height was 1.62 meter and 2.63 meter respectively it was indicated that minimum mean swell wave height and the significant wave height was 1.28 meter and 2.25 meter temperature was 27 celsius and pressure 17.25 Newton per square. The wind speed was varying 1.5 meter per second to 17.4 meter second during this period. This is the Hamman Harbour, and uh, there is a white circle. That is the place we are focusing to install OWC. The 8 to 10 kilowatt per meter of monthly average wave power can be generated through this project. I calculated with one month data and found that it comes around 8.8 kilowatt per meter. That is uh, actually Professor Jonathan Green is expert on this. I asked him. He said this uh, uh, harvesting. Uh, is enough to set up a good port of break port or whatever is here amount of depth also sufficient the inside 17 17 meter and outside 14 meter is there conclusion it was very clear that the swell wave height and the significant wave height are sufficient to generate wave power and feasible to set up a rain water type OWC ocean wave energy converter at Amarth Harbour recommends to carry out another study to collect swell wave and significant wave data for continuous three years to confirm the suitability of this project further recommends to setting up OWC model when testing the general surgeon for the Lavra Defence University and simulating similar conditions basically if we can set up a wind testing here we can simulate that and carry out 
most studies related to turbine. What are the most suitable turbine for this? The basically one-way valves are integrated with this system. We can find out what are the valves we can use and how effectively it is used for this particular work. Optimization work with economy of effort. If you go with the simulator, the similar, uh, similar simulator set up at uh, Australian Maritime College and uh, we used to use that to get all the uh, optimization work. A winner is dreamer who never give up. This is Nelson Mandela. Thank you. Today I am leaving from KDU. I hope that young people and the lecturers will continue with this idea. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, so I, I think you can leave KDU, but you should not leave the idea. No. Basically, I am trying to practically work it out before. Yes. And uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate this kind of research because uh, marine sustainable energy is really important. And according to the energy policy in Sri Lanka, we are going to something like self sustain energy sources, right? then milk energy is a good source to achieve that target. So in that case, uh, this kind of research is a very valuable research. And uh, actually, I have one question. I think the same question might be there in the industry as well. When they want to invest on this kind of project. According to one of your slides, you said uh, the available energy is 2 TW and what we can harness is 0 0.5 TW that is the 25 percent that we can get. So uh, maybe uh, so not something directly related to your research but uh, I would like to clarify this point from your expertise. So that is uh, are there any development or research yes. going to increase that 0.5 value to a higher value so then I think uh, then the investors will invest. Yes, uh, it's a good question. <coughs> Actually now uh, the OWC in fifth generation. I did the research on fourth generation. That is uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, Kaplan and other turbines, we introduced radial inflow turbine at uh, Utah's uh, University of Tasmania and improve the efficiency up to 56% and we tested the one way where basically uh, turbine is running in one way uh, you have to keep a valve the end of the uh, OWC uh, we were trying to improve the valves, one way valves but similarly, I hope still the fifth generation research is going on at the AMC and people are working with that. Uh, most probably, they will be able to get uh, more than 25% of uh, energy from this uh, OWC. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your clarification and I have one uh, request from you, right? So I think uh, this kind of research is very important. So I think we need to encourage our young people, right? young people in school children uh, in, uh, in, to do research and make an interest in these kind of things and I would like to make a request from you. Is it possible to you to write a Sinhala newspaper article, newspaper article? So then, I think this kind of idea will really go to the normal people in the country, and uh, then uh, they will value this kind of things, right? So what my feeling is, uh, in, in our country, many people play that engineers we are not doing something for the society, and we are there, and they don't know whether we are doing this kind of research. 
whether we are trying to do this kind of innovation. So I think uh, this kind of thing should not hide in this kind of English <laughs> symposium proceedings, but it should go to uh, general people in the public. So that's my, this is just a request. That's why a kilowatt hour. A kilowatt hour. No, no. I don't have that data, but it is huge. That's why still in uh, the research scale, that, uh, there, there is no country went for commercialization till now. No, 100% this will come because uh, fossil fuel is depleting. Of, obviously, we have to go for something else. Maybe when compared to the wind, wind no, energy. No. So, solar, solar is good for us, tropical countries, not for Australia, not for uh, Europe. Right? They have to go with uh, this. Okay. And, and uh, the doctor, I want to add a few things uh, to the first question what you raised. Actually, there are, apart from the, the oscillating water currents, there are many types. If you consider the one way is the, the differential, submerged differential pressure uh, type. The other one will be, of course, generally use the point absorbers. Then again, surge convergence. Likewise, many uh, the convert, uh, the many uh, units are there where we can harvest the, the wave energy. The thing is, all the things are based on the, the deep sea applications. Where do we install the maintenance cost of it the number one aspect we have to consider? The most efficient one, and the, if you compare all the things with this cost, we can uh, go in with the water column, oscillated, oscillated water column uh, units. Because it is, of course, the, uh, the coastal based. And many researchers are buying on around the world. Uh, regarding all the types and I also feel like uh, the, uh, if you consider the oscillating water column type that uh, research if you increase much more interest in the, the society that will be more beneficial for a country like us of course and it is uh, the, uh, uh, considering the financial aspects also like our country and it is very much beneficial for the country to go ahead with this type of research rather than the other types. Thank you. I, I also totally agree. Thank you very much for your briefing. Yes, so we will uh, get to your questions at the end. Okay. 
takes uh, the river flow pattern gets modified. Modified in the sense the uh, flow pattern is there. Since it, 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 it acts as an obstruction, the flow pattern gets changed. Uh, so there, and also since the transport of sediments is again a function of flow, the transport capacity is also being modified due to this. So, uh, because of the interference of the river flow to the bridge pier, we can see an increase uh, in the mean velocity of flowing water in the river flow. And three principal flow features can be notified during this phenomenon. Uh, so, first one is the downflow at the face of the pier. So, in the downward direction, there are only one flow, the horseshoe vortex at the base of the pier, and finally, the wave vortices form at the downstream direction of the pier. So, the, this vortex action basically removes the sediment uh, from and around the base of a pier causing a, cover, causing a hole around the bridge pier. So, as, as it is shown in this figure, when it comes to the total cover depth around the bridge pier, it is, it is a combination of basically three types of cover. One is the uh, local cover, the contraction cover and then the long term bed change. So, uh, as I already told you, cover depth, the term it represents the amount, the level by which the river bed lowers around the bridge pier. Uh, as per the reports of the Road Development Authority Sri Lanka, many bridges in Sri Lanka have already been subjected to this threat of, uh, of this uh, scovering, right? But uh, very slight, uh, uh, um, in, um, many studies have not been done focused on this issue. Yet. So, as it is shown in the figure, this is Margol Bridge. This bridge also had collapsed in the year 2006 due to abutment erosion and scover damage. Apart from that, there are several bridges which have already been subjected to scovering, and uh, none of the studies have been done on this issue yet. So, in my study, I am focusing on the development of a numerical model by which I can uh, uh, estimate the or predict the depth of cover hole around the bridge pier. After a comprehensive literature study, I uh, uh, about uh, on a different uh, kind of software which is available for modeling, I selected HECRAS model for the analysis uh, and also this software is freely available for use. In literature, there is many evidence of, of, of using this software but in one dimensional approach. So when it comes to scovering, it's basically not a one-dimensional uh, activity because of the, uh, the board. Uh, as I explained in the first uh, first few slides, there's a downward flow which is also created when because of the interference of the river flow in the pier. So uh, I selected the 2D modeling approach for my study. So in this approach, basically a two-dimensional numerical model is developed using the HECRA software by coupling the uh, uh, hydraulic model with the sediment model. So when it comes to the uh, comes to hydraulic modeling of the river flow, if you it uses a finite volume solution scheme, and also uh, in this 2D approach, it simulates the uh, flow and water profiles in two dimensions. The governing laws for the 2D model are the conservation of mass and conservation of momentum. Moving on to the uh, sediment modeling approach, sediment modeling is, uh, simulates the movement and deposition of sediments in the river and channels. Uh, so, uh, and the two-dimensional uh, two sediment transport is also wet material load transport equation. The total load sediment transport is equal to the sum of all particles that are transported in the river flow. Moving on to my uh, case study, uh, I selected a bridge which is constructed across the Tamil River in Sri Lanka, that is a hung valley bridge. Uh, there are se several bridges, uh, there, are, there are about 14 bridges, but based on the availability of the bridge geometry data and also other boundary condition data which I need to feed into my model, I selected hung valley bridge for the analysis. So these are the properties of the bridge. This bridge basically has three piers, and uh, these are the, the uh, this image like uh, the images are not very clear because it's kind of old. So these are the uh, plan views I obtained from the plan and sectional views I obtained from the road development also. So as per them, this bridge also has been subject uh, have been exposed to the covering around the bridge piers, and it poses a threat to the stability. Uh, and when, when we consider about the Tamil River Basin, uh, major flood events have occurred in the years 1980 
1969 and then after that in the year 2016. So I selected uh, the most severe flood case for my analysis. So moving on to the meteorology, as I already told, this cover is not a one-dimensional activity. Uh, this software includes two equations for the estimation of this cover depth, that is the Colorado CSU equation and the Rowling equation. But those are numerical approaches. These are more focused towards the one-dimensional modeling approach. But I just uh, I didn't use those uh, equations to estimate this cover depth. But I did those. I use by uh, doing the modeling. I uh, estimate uh, after running the model. I uh, got the obtained the level by which the river bed has lowered around the bridge pier. So uh, the hydraulic model is uh, combined or coupled with the sediment model in order to get the river bed level change. So the total transport flow, uh, flow transport formula is used over here. The main advantage is to reduce computational cost since it requires one less transport equation solution. So this is the total bed change equation. <coughs> Moving on to the two-dimensional hydraulic model, let's see the inputs, uh, the modification of river bed energy. When uh, that is, so I, uh, I obtained the lighter data, but uh, we know lighter data is, uh, just has a surface level elevation. So, in order to get a more realistic view of the bathymetry of the river, uh, uh, the, the, I, like, uh, the river cross section data was available for the year 2003. So, those cross section data were fed into the model and a geotip was combined with that. that uh, the, the geotip was combined with the lighter data in order to get a clear view more clear uh, terrain of the uh, more clear terrain of the uh, location. So there, as you can sh see in this figure, the red file color shows the combined terrain which was used for the model. Uh, moving on to the land use data, the salinity river basin is basically the low salinity river basin is heavily urbanized, uh, and the suggestions of chalk were taken into consideration in assigning and managing the value. A separate polygon was created along the Calendar River in order to assign mining and value separately because that is a method like I had to adjust the mining and value in order to calculate the model. Then the boundary conditions. So in order to run the model, two boundary conditions were needed. One at the upstream and one at the upper. One is the upper boundary condition and the other one is the lower boundary condition. Uh, so based on the availability of data, upper boundary condition was used as the Humpelder uh, was the uh, yeah, flow hydrograph was used and then the downstream boundary condition was used as a tidal value. So these are the tidal values which were fed into the model. Uh, so calculation time step, the bridge piers were embedded into the terrain. So after getting the combined terrain, the terrain, a uh, uh, virtual zone of the terrain was created and then piers were embedded into that. Uh, so as, as you can see on the figure, so computational time step was taken as one minute and it was adjusted based on the coordinate number. This coordinate number is basically used to ascertain the time step in the software. Uh, then moving on to the sediment model and the inputs. Uh, so uh, the sediment model performs well with the shadow mode equation and in this software the, uh, the sediment model has the capacity to calculate the sediment transport for each grid in the mesh. Uh, then calling the river bed gradation, so particle size distribution analysis was done for uh, the river bed samples taken at several locations along the Calendar River uh, in order to fill it into the model. Then initial conditions and transport parameters, so uh, the boom method was selected, this was also selected based on a comprehensive literature study and the boom method which is very applicable to the, based on the other parameters that were already fed into the model, this method was also selected. Uh, then uh, the development is uh, two-dimensional in nature, the sorting method was adapted. So the sediment boundary condition, uh, the rating curve boundary condition was adapted. This also the data was available with the Central Environmental Authority. Moving on to the results, so initially the hybrid model was calibrated and verified before coupling it with the sediment model. So this shows the uh, comparison of the water levels which, are, which I obtained from the model as well as the observed data. So the uh, model performance was evaluated using stat statistical parameters, R squared, and then NSC and the root mean square error, so uh, those are the values. Then uh, the values are in an acceptable range and also uh, the, the sediment modeling output, uh, the sediment transport model was executed for the 2016 flood event 
uh, uh, once the model is running provides the bed level change. So, uh, and as you can see in this figure, there are three piers are shown because this bridge has three piers. So, uh, uh, the, the, the green color line shows the initial elevation and uh, once after the model was run, after the 2016 starting event, the bed level, that is the most severe starting event which has occurred in the recent past. So after that it's are the the amount by which the river bed has lowered. So the total amount of by which the river bed has lowered around the bridge pier provides this cover depth, total cover depth. Uh, so but in order to validate this model, observe was data was not available exactly at the bridge site, but uh, there were cross section data was available with the irrigation department at a distance 20 meters upstream from the bridge. So that data was combined, was uh, compared with the data I obtained from the model in order to validate the model to a certain extent. So after that, after validating, these are the uh, results I obtained. And then moving on to the conclusion of my uh, paper, uh, a two dimensional numerical model is developed using the HECRA software here for so the simulation of power depth. Calibration was done by changing the magnetic uh, uh, coefficient and the sediment transfer function parameters respectively. Uh, river bed level change around the bridge piers was comparatively high. Uh, so, this results indicate that the grass model is capable of depicting the bed level change associated with the formation of cover holes. Finally, I would like to say, uh, as I told you, since the exactly the observed bed levels at the bridge site was not available, further validation of the model results will be done. Will be done this is I, I have already started that. I am doing by way based on a series of laboratory scale experiments. So these are the references, and I would like to thank the Secretary Department of University of Manitoba, uh, and also thank you very much for listening. If there are any questions, you can ask. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your presentation and the time to be exceeded. So actually, uh, we don't have uh, time for Q&A for you. But I will ask one question from you. Are you planning to validate this model using a JD?
all of those have been caused due to multi-day rainfall. So not just one day of rainfall, but uh, multiple days of rainfall. So again, uh, you may uh, try to coordinate the multiple rainfall with flooding. It's flooding, yes. Uh, because most of Sri Lanka studies have been focused on one day rainfall or annual rainfall, not multi-day rainfall. So I believe that it's important to focus on multi-day rainfall as well, not just one day and uh, annual. Future, we may consider like uh, for flood events, uh, not only the multi-day rainfall, as well as the, uh, the land use pattern, the drainage facilities, which also can be considered uh, by incorporating uh, the flood uh, with the multi-day rainfall. And uh, those factors have to be also playing a vital uh, role. And uh, my uh, second one question to uh, engineer. Thank you. 
and tokens of appreciation. To avoid certificates of participation, I kindly invite Dr. Samir Samarasekhar on stage, accompanied by Dr. Ishani Rais. Thank you. 
Nations at the 16th International Research Conference of General Research on Katalalu Defense University. <laughs> Starting off with post test one, mechanical and process engineering. Design and fabrication of a coconut sorting machine, authored by DNR Pereira, RNA Rajapaksha, KGC Harrison, DHRG University, and PPSS Kosovidia. I kindly invite the presenting author to receive your certificates. Development of an efficient automated tea making machine with customized ingredient levels, ordered by RPMV Rangania, ADP Vijay Kalaka, EMU Bill Ekanayaka, PNA Commando, and IM Akarunia. Water treatment efficiency of aerator of graphic filter in treating groundwater. A case study of Mulatiu of Sri Lanka, authored by M. V. Sutarsan and Ena Noja. <laughs> Moving on to post plus two, automation and development engineering. First title, Gripper Enhanced Fabric Cut Piece Sorting System Based on Defects, authored by P. C. Heva Vikarana. LDU TV Krutunga, TNN Raj Paksha, PSN Chalagunda, and HDI POE. <laughs> Smart Cash Rate Management System, authored by BMTP Ragnarika, RMCP Ramasinga, and ERMCK Raj Paksha. Development of an automated clothes bank system, authored by M.S. Sabutanki, G.K. Dananjir, J.A.C.A. Pereira, and U.N.N.D. Ubesi Varpina. <laughs> Barriers for pedestrian-related road crash analysis in identifying engineering countermeasures, authored by T.W.K. Ivan Dias. Moving on to post capacity, electrical and electronic engineering. Implementation of Arduino based Internet of Things, Home Automation Systems in Sri Lanka, authored by TC Heva Vitarina. Development of intelligent outdoor camera segmentation detection system for large scale camera systems using deep learning, authored by KUR Marapana, SMK KC Marathana, MS Gunakavida, HKAYU Kodituaku, and TLU Marathana. Modern accident alerts 
system for vehicles using global positioning system technology, authored by PDT and Dakshina and RMCP Ranasinghe. Design and Development and E-Rectro as a Sustainable Energy Solution, authored by MCP Lisanayaka, KRE MSP Ekanayaka, RDL Mecham Ratna, and MCH Chandrasri. <laughs> Software defined radio based drone detection using machine learning algorithm authored by W.M.H. Vandar Naika and H.M.C. Gunapilika. <laughs> Moving on to post office pro, biomedical engineering, plus tackle, indoor human clothing assistive robot with full detection capability for the elderly and the different level, authored by SSN Ratna, BCG Soiza, AMS Sinaratna, EC Pharmacy, and PSG Palayulia. <laughs> Review for intra-body communication using galvanic coupling for wearable devices, authored by. ST Comelike and WPLK Vijay Singh. 